If you can build a tool where I can point and click on any spot on the chart and it shows at the volume weighted average price as a moving average from there, I'm in. And they did it, and they did it quick. And and now you know it's it's in TrendSpider, it's in you know stock charts. Just added it about a month ago. Um, Optima has it. Uh, Wealth Charts has it. So it's becoming a lot more out there. This is the How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast, brought to you by 10MinuteStockTrader.com, where we cover finance, stocks, options, entrepreneurship, education, and money. And here's your host, voted one of the top 100 people in finance, Christopher Ewell. Hey there, podcast. This episode is sponsored by ResearchDrivenNews.com, where you can gain access and get instant breaking news before the crowd. And they've got something really special for you over at ResearchDrivenNews.com slash report. They just released a special free report that you have just got to check out. There you'll find what some people are calling the Shopify of mobile and the top six reasons to read this under the radar report. They specialize in showcasing companies that are projected to maintain double digit growth figures into the next year and beyond. Now today they're featuring a growing company that's severely undervalued compared to its top peers and has multiple catalysts in place for expansion. Now listen, don't just take my word for it. Go check out this free report today and find out more about it over at researchdrivennews.com slash report. That's researchdrivennews.com slash report. Hey, listen, if this podcast was useful to you at all, I really highly suggest that you go check out the full trading course at AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com. Hey, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so you'll be notified every time we give you more tools, tips, and tricks to help you trade faster and trade smarter every single week. Hey there, traders. Welcome back to today's How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Today, we have a special guest online, Brian Shannon. Brian is the founder of AlphaTrends.net. He's also a certified market technician and author of the book, Technical Analysis Using Multiple Time Frames, which you can get on Amazon today, right now, in fact. And uh, Brian, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I'm, I'm really excited to have you on. You're kind of a little bit of a celebrity, I got to say. Internet celebrity, man. Internet Technical celebrity, yeah. Celebrity. It's, uh, <laughs> it's not. It's it, it's not like a Hollywood guy. That's for sure. <laughs> Thanks for having me on too, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. So what I wanted to do today was really just uh, learn more about you, more about your process, more about your company, and uh, dive even into the anchored VWAP, which is what I know that you are are known for. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you a hot mic and, uh, you know, just uh, give us your background. Tell us, tell, us the, tell us the Brian Shannon story. I'm really interested to hear this. Okay. Well, let's start back when I was about 10 years old, sitting in my dad's lap watching Wall Street Week, and that was 43 years ago. So um, I, you know, I used to watch that with him, just to kind of hang out with my dad and picked up on things. And you know, when I was about 12, uh, I had my first stock trade, which is a company called Lojack. And, you know, we bought it at, uh, I think it was $5 per share. And then about three months later, it doubled. So I thought I was a genius. My dad, so I, I had, uh, you know, money saved up. My dad basically gave me leverage. So I had $500. He put up 4,500. We bought a thousand shares and I nice. made $5,000 at this young age. So I was kind of like, why do people work when you can do this, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, I was uh, went through college and all that, uh, get out of college uh, with a, a, a business degree, which, you know, it's just general business. I, uh, and then started out at a retail brokerage firm in Boston. That was 1991. And I was more interested in being a trader than a uh, telemarketer, which is mm -hmm, <laughs> what a stockbroker is. So, you know, I, 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 tr I, I did the broker thing for about four years, uh, moved to Denver uh, and was a broker here for a little while as well. Um, but, you know, it, it gave, I, I like to kid around about it, and it, but it, it's, it's, uh, it, I didn't do any damage and it wasn't nefarious, but I, I got to practice with other people's money. Uh, being a broker, and and I was a lot more aggressive than what most of the you know branch managers wanted me to be in terms of trading and you know moving in and out of stocks. But I, I learned a whole bunch. Um, so I think it was maybe ninety five or six. I answered you know to IBD used to have this uh, 
you know, on the back page, there was a little thing about, you know, put up $25,000, get $250,000 buying power. So it's generic trading was the name of the company. And I, I went for it. I was, I shouldn't have, you know, anyone would tell you based on my income at the time, the amount of savings I had, my pregnant wife and, and no other source of income. But, you know, fortunately, I, I, I've got a very strong sense of risk management. Um, it, so I was able to make it work uh, and I was consistently profitable. I, you know, then, you know, branched into opening a day trading office in Denver and then, you know, getting that uh, absorbed by another company called MarketWise. And MarketWise, I was the head of proprietary trading there as well as, you know, trading their funds and created educational content. Uh, worked on putting, you know, classes and that sort of thing together. So, you know, I left MarketWise in, oh, I guess it was about 15, 14 years ago. Um, and then started Alpha Trends. Uh, it was alphatrends.blogspot at the time because I didn't mm. know anything about websites. I still really don't. But <laughs> uh, so alphatrends.com, as you notice, is some wacky uh, <laughs> apology type. You know, thing. That, that's exactly what I did. I was like, all right, let me talk to Brian real quick. I'm going to pull up alphatrends.com, make sure I, I, I am in the right place. And I'm like, that is not <laughs> his site. And then I Google it and I was like, oh, it's alphatrends.net. So when you yeah. guys are going to go look up Brian, alphatrends.net is the right place to go. <laughs> so right. So so I started doing YouTube videos and I was kind of one of the first ones to do that. Um, and, it, it, you know, that was before it was actually YouTube. It was uh, Google videos and then Google acquired YouTube. So anyways, I, I've been, you know, been doing that and, you know, kind of built the audience. And uh, the people at Stock Choice, Howard Lindzen, approached me. Um, and said, hey, you know, you've got this audience. We we can build a product for you uh, and, you know, sell subscriptions. You, you, you know, you're getting 5,000 views uh, on your videos. Why not monetize it? Yeah, let's do it. So that's how I got into, you know, the kind of the subscription business. I, I trade every day, um, you know, sometimes too much. Uh, <laughs> But it, it is, uh, you know, it, it's still it's still my passion. I mean, after all these years of, of doing this full time, I've had slumps and, and, you know, times over the years that, you know, maybe, you know, back to the H the high frequency days, let's say five years ago when markets weren't really making as much sense. I was kind of wondering, you know, am I getting too old for this game? It's not making sense anymore. So I gravitated more towards, you know, swing trading again, because that's where I started was swing trading, then got really into day trading. And now it's more, you know, I, I try to be a swing trader. I don't try to day trade, but I'll take them if they're just right there in front of me. Mm -hmm. So that kind of brings it full, you know, and I wrote the book in 2008 and that continues to, you know, to get a lot of uh, great reviews. And, and uh, here we are today. Um, I'm, you know, made a name, I guess, late, you know, the last few years of uh, for the anchored volume weighted average price. And that's that's pretty much gets us up to speed, I think. All right. Well, I tell you, I, I remember um, when I was leaving college, um, I interviewed with Edward Jones and that was uh, – I was able to see it for what it was like you were talking about is right. it's, it's just sales. I mean, it's really like you're getting somebody's money into this account, do it again tomorrow, every single day. Yeah. And that just wasn't for me. I'm no salesman. Like, like I that, wasn't either. I, yeah. I learned a lot, but I, I wasn't, I wasn't a natural born salesman, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, uh, being able to practice with other people's money, <laughs> What a luxury that was. Because <laughs> right. I, I, I mean, I tell people this all the time. I lost five figures, you know, trying to figure out how to trade. And then yes. once I figured it out, it's like, oh, OK, I, I was overcomplicating everything. And now I've simplified it and just made much more money and much more sense. So who would have right. thought? And you're probably holding losers more. I mean, you're kind of forced to hold a loser at a brokerage firm in a way. Like, why did you sell that stock when it was down? Well, because it's continuing to go down. And, well, you, then you got them into something else. Be careful so you're not churning an account. It was never the intent to, you know, produce commissions. Uh, I mean, that's always there. But, you, you know, it's, you got to do the right thing for the customer. And, mm -hmm. and there's just so many conflicts of interest in in the way that business used to be with the super high i mean they were two four hundred dollar commissions one wow. way and that just you know it, that's a huge obstacle to start with you know do you think that the 
big commissions were maybe a good thing because like now we have zero commissions and everybody and then a lot of people who got their stimulus money right they i I heard a lot of horror stories that they just blew it or they did really well and then they didn't actually know how to trade and then they lost an even bigger sum right yeah do you think that the uh the race to zero maybe hurt some people i'm sure it hurts some because there's just going to be that type of personality out there um, you know, it, it certainly, I think, has in, uh, increased the frequency of, of people's trading because oh, yeah. that's no longer an obstacle. Um, but I, I don't think it's I don't think it's a bad way to learn with a twelve hundred or sixteen hundred dollar stimulus to you know to blow it up and, and learn that mistake before you do it with a big account, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, and without having those obstacles of commissions, I, I I'm all for the Robin Hood type model, and I think it's. You know, if I had that when I was younger, I who knows how my career might have been different. Um, but there, you know, there's a lot of obstacles that have been removed for you know getting into the market. And I think that's that's a fantastic thing. Oh yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, being able to get in and out when I first started, it was about ten dollars commission, which is still mm-hmm. now these days it's like outlandish to even think you know ten dollars commission either way. That's crazy, and especially like like for example, doing an iron condor. Right. Let's say I'm telling you, like, this is how I started. Right. Iron Condor, one dollar wide. Um, the max profit on the trade I could have made was like 40 bucks. And then I'm paying 20 dollars in commissions either way. Like, there's right. no way I could do this. No, <laughs> it doesn't work. No. Yep. So, yeah, the technology has uh, enabled a lot of really incredible changes and, and that I'm really grateful for. And one of those changes, speaking of technology, um let's lead that into the anchor vwap so sure. i've heard of vwap but vwap is like one of the the newer items in my vocabulary i guess you could say like mm-hmm. i remember people talking about vwap and things and i was like what is a vwap and for the audience out there it's volume weighted uh <laughs> volume weighted average price <laughs> and um it, it, it it's interesting because it it shows where buyers and sellers are holding Right? Am I am I saying that correctly? Yeah, but, exactly. Okay, I was just going to say, but you've taken it one step further. Well, so the, it started out in 1988 as a uh, benchmark for institutions who wanted to see how well their orders were being executed. So if you had a half million shares and you said to Fidelity or Merrill or whoever and said, "Listen, you know, buy me a half million shares of Intel today," and the stock traded between 88 and 91. And you get filled at, you know, 90, 25, you look and go, well, you know, what, how does that compare to anything? So what it did was actually was for the course of one day, the volume weighted average price. If you took, it's like a dollar cost average, Chris, if you take a thousand dollars and put it into Apple each and every month, at the end of the year, your, your cost basis is $12,000 and you might have bought eight shares one month, three shares one month, or whatever. So it's it's your dollar cost average from any starting point. It happened to be, it started just for that day, the period. Mm-hmm. So it was the average price the business was transacted at. Buyers, sellers, short sellers, et cetera. So I kind of stumbled into it in about 2004 as a technical study, uh, and, it, and it was a it, it was it was a horizontal trend line that I could start at any point and then I would move it across the screen and I would see it, you know, going up and down as I moved it across. And I started to notice it would like, you know, fine, it would bounce perfectly at, at certain levels. So, you know, fast forward to about, uh, so I guess, uh, 2014, uh, the people at TC2000 uh, were, were, you know, c- kind of courting me to use their software. And I said, listen, if you can build a tool where I can point and click on any spot on the chart and it shows the volume weighted average price as a moving average from there, I'm in. And they did it and they did it quick. And and now, you know, it's, it's in trend spider. It's in, you know, stock charts just added it about a month ago. Um, Optima has it, uh, wealth charts has it. So it's becoming a lot more, out there as a tool and it allows us to really i kind of view it as a sentiment uh indicator so if we say you know the stock gapped up one day uh you know that's an event it's a measurable event so if we take the average price from that gap 
and we can see that the stock is rising and holding above it and finding buyers, it's acting as dynamic support or on the opposite side as dynamic resistance. One of the best places to really look at it is, is uh, you know, in, in the easiest way for people to initially see it is in an initial uh, public offering, IPOs. They're just great because everyone has the same starting point. Mm. Because you know, one of the things is, well, where do I where do I measure from? Where do I right. start my anchor? Um, and you can do you know month to date, year to date. You can do it from eleven thirty on, and that is you know you can really get stuck in the weeds on it. But if you you know use swing highs and swing lows, you can say from that pullback high, the average price as it's declined is declining as well. When it gets back above that, it tells me that the average participant on the long side is making money and the average short is now losing money in that position. So now if I can find that low risk entry where I have a tight stop, it makes sense because the buyers are back in control. Hmm. Okay, so this is really interesting. So I, I've played with it some, but not really in the the depth and breadth that you have your your knowledge in it. You've kind of taken this, this um, almost like deep level of uh, indicator and you've kind of brought it mainstream, right? right? So, I mean, something that was only available for um, institutions is now available literally on the right click on my trend spider screen. The crazy um, thing is it's not even on Bloomberg, Bloomberg, Chris. I mean, they pay what, $12,000 a, yeah. a month, a year. I, I, it's, a, it's expensive, you right. know, but they don't have it there. It's crazy. So why do you feel that like, why do you feel that this is, and I only ask this because like this is like from from an outsider's perspective, like sure. this is what you're known for. And um, I, I think that's really cool to be known for something. Why do you feel that the Anchor VWAP is so powerful and such a, a tool that that uh, all traders should use? It, it shows the actual supply and demand and who's in control from any point in time. I can measure from any point in time. We can look at it and eyeball it. We can look at a simple moving average time based, mm -hmm. but the market isn't based on time. We put the time constraint there. Instead, it's event driven most of the time. So we can say from that Federal Reserve event, from the election, what's the average price? Are the buyers or sellers in control? And there's just no second guessing. It's not overbought. It's not oversold. It's who's in control. And it often acts as dynamic support on pullbacks. You'll see that it'll find buyers magically at that number. It, it's, it's, it blows my mind. I was just tweeting about that yesterday, that it blew my mind on the S&P 500 that the most recent pullback hit perfectly on a volume weighted average price level that I had identified in advance. I didn't buy there because I was thinking, there's no way. <laughs> mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I mean, it nailed it to the low. And it, it just, it, again, it's, it's true supply and demand. There's no subjectivity really to it other than where do you place the anchor? And if you're doing it at, you know, a swing high or a swing low, it's pretty objective there. Uh, you know, if you use it properly, it can really give you that key metric of who's in control from any point in time, because all, we all have different time frames. I mean, a, a day trader might use it from the two o'clock high to the two thirty pullback low and buy as it breaks above that. Whereas, a, you know, an investor might look at uh, a, a chart that has, you know, kind of created a longer term two year base, and now it's getting back above the volume weighted average price from that high two years, three years ago. Now we've settled in, the supply and demand is balanced out and the buyers are gaining control. Now we can get involved, manage risk and see if the market will let us continue to hold in the direction that we're, that our, that our bets are unfolding. So whenever you're talking about the, the recent low on the S&P that it bounced off of, now to give the, the audience some context here, um, this is November 6, 2020 that we're recording this. The elections happened, but we still don't have a president decided yet, which is right. fun <laughs> in one way to say. Um, but uh, the market kind of like stair stepped down and then took an elevator up, which is the opposite right. of north normal times. Right. Where did you where did you anchor it before that in order to have it bounce off that that support level? Like what was yeah, your this, key that you anchored from? 
Great question. And and, and, and it, I will just refer people over to Twitter, uh, where my handle is Alpha Trends, if they want to, you know, mm-hmm. find the chart. I think I posted it uh, just, you know, maybe even November 1st or something like that. But what I did was first I took the uh, the low from, the, you know, the pandemic low in March and put a volume weighted average price on that bottom. Well, we only knew it was a bottom about or, or an important level, at least a level of interest about a week or so after that mm-hmm. low was made. So when I put a volume weighted average price on that, it then pulled back and hit it about three weeks later. So when it hit it, it bounced dramatically from there. And what I do is called, you know, laddering or uh, uh, stairs, you know, uh, uh, sorry, a handoff or, you know, passing the torch and putting it from where it hit. So if I anchor it off that low, it comes down, hits that and bounces. Then I'll put one off of the bounce low. Okay. And, it, and, and this is just through experimentation that I found out that, you know, the buyers regain control for another momentum campaign. And then off of, and then three months later, it comes down and hits a, a new intermediate term low. So this volume weighted average price was uh, actually uh, anchored off of the May low. And that May low was hit in late or mid-September. And then again, just, uh, uh, what was the date here? I'm sorry, uh, October 30th, it hit that date. And that's the day I posted it actually on Twitter. I didn't expect that, you know, I said, here's a level of interest. Mm. In, you know, the way I look at it is, a, you know, a lot of people say the market is at support or the market is going to find resistance here. We don't know support and resistance till after the fact. Mm-hmm. So I like to call them a level of interest. And, and what I mean by that is when it comes down to this level of interest, that it doesn't tell me just blindly buy. Some people do that, and, you know, but, but to me, I'm, I'm, I tend to be more risk averse. So it tells me it's a level of interest. And what that means is I want to look at shorter term time frames for actual evidence that the buyers are gaining control. So it comes down to, you know, back to my book, technical analysis using multiple time frames. We want trend alignment. So we've got a, a you know, in a major uptrend. It pulls back intermediate term. We're in a downtrend. And then it settles in and short term might turn sideways and then make a short term higher high. That's where I want to get involved, where the momentum shows me that we have an important low. I don't know if it's going to be the low, mm-hmm. but if, if we make that higher high, then I can get involved on the uh, short term time frame, protect myself with a stop and the rest is up to the market. So um, it's it's just fascinating to to sit down with a chart and click on important highs and lows on any any chart uh, in any time frame and notice how the volume weighted average price will just magically be the exact level sometimes. It, it, again, it blows my mind. I've been doing this, you know, using the, the volume weighted average price first discovered in 2004, and it, it, it just continues to blow my mind. I can't say it enough. Brian, I don't know what your hourly rate is, but everybody who's listening to this podcast, um, you just got a, a incredible value of zero dollars and zero cents to listen to Brian with that like crazy knowledge drop right there. Brian, that was incredible. Thank you for that. Like it's I, tough to envision without the chart there. I no, hope no, it no, wasn't, I, you know, too esoteric, but no, yeah. no, no, it's good. Like, like in my head, I'm thinking, holy cow, this is so good. <laughs> so man, that that was awesome. Um, okay. So so we got it bouncing off the lows. And one of the things that that I learned um in my expensive endeavor endeavors and how to, you know how to play the game of Monopoly, I guess you could say, is, right. uh, you know, buying when things turn around instead of trying to call the bottom. And, yeah. you know, you said something there that I really, 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 I believe in my core and that like, there's not support and resistance. And, and I've just like, I've, I don't know, just the, the, the support and resistance just like grinds on me. But the way you described it as level of interest really, I think is a game changer. Because you're totally right. There's no buddy that's saying as it's dropping, heading towards that anchor VWAP or any other moving average or anything else you want to see, that it's going to magically bounce right off of that point. That's, but that's, yeah, I, I was just going to say, but the point that you also uh, extended upon that with is that you're looking for it now to have found that bottom and then start to reverse and go higher. And then that's your signal. And right. that right there, I think... If, if you didn't already take notes on this, go back about eight minutes and listen to Ryan again. That was super wisdom right there. 
Well, thanks. It's you know, you know, and I'll tell you, I, I kind of talk about this once in a while on Twitter. I'll be in a grumpy mood and say, I, I just don't understand this. Buy the F and dip, people. You don't <laughs> buy the dip. Buy after the dip, and the buyers have regained control. Why put your money at risk? Why play guessing games? We can actually see objectively where the buyers regain control. The thing is that we have egos, and we all want to be so smart that we pick the bottom. But a pullback might keep pulling back below your 10-day moving average, below your 20, below your 50, and is, you know, below your 38.2% retracement. Those are all mm-hmm. great levels of interest as well mm-hmm. at, at 20-day moving average. A lot of times we find a bounce at a 20-day moving average, but it doesn't mean you just blindly stick your bid in. Understand the psychology of what happens at that 20-day moving average. Maybe the stock got you know two, three standard deviations above it, and we've got some aggressive hedge funds that decide we're going to short it down to the 20-day moving average because typically our back testing says it will come back to the 20-day moving average. So it's at that three standard deviations, and they start adding supply, and that slows the stock down. Other long players are saying, hey, it's slowing down. Maybe it take a little bit of my profits off. And the sideline cash says, hey, it's you know it's kind of extended. I'm going to stop buying up here. So what happens? We have more supply and we have less demand. The stock starts trickling down. You know, We find buyers along the way. But shorter term, we see this pattern emerging on, let's say, a, you know, using 10-minute or 15-minute candles. We see this pattern of lower highs and lower lows. It gets down to that 20-day moving average. And maybe it took a week and a half, two weeks to get there. And then what do we see? Well, we see the 20-day moving averages there, and a lot of us have been trained, whether a 20-day or a 50-day or whatever, that there's often support there. So what happens? Well, the hedge fund who sold short up there says, this was our objective because there's often support here. We're going to start bidding for the stock. So they start adding a little bit of demand. And then the long institution who maybe sold some up above is going to say, hey, let's support the stock. We, you know, we sold half a million on the way up. Let's bid for another hundred to help create the chart and bring further demand in. Mm-hmm. Sidelined cash comes in and says, hey, I'm going to stop selling this. I'm going to start. So we, we, what I'm, the point I'm trying to build is it's, it's supply and demand and trying to understand the motivations of other people that the shorts are going to try to you know, cover in there and, and, and take their profits. The longs are going to start adding. Sideline cash starts looking at it. So you start to see on that 10, 15 minute time frame, you're getting, it's not 10 or 15 minutes of time, but you know, over you know, maybe that week and a half of pullback, we're looking at 15 minute candles. And you start to see that the pattern of lower highs and lower lows is starting to turn sideways. Mm-hmm. Some of the moving averages are turning sideways. It's neutralizing. So it says, hey, we're at that level of interest. We're, you know, this is what we anticipated. Now what we need is that short-term higher high. That's where I'm going to participate. So we anticipate, we participate, we set our stop, we take a little bit on the way up. As it starts making higher highs and higher lows on that 15-minute time frame, we raise our stop up underneath and leave the rest to the market and understand the psychology of that supply and demand rather than just say, well, the 50-day moving average is support, so I'm going to buy there. What a stupid approach that is. <laughs> God, you're so right. Oh, Brian, this is such gold right here. Okay, so there's so much to, to unpack there. So, you know, one of the things I love about TrendSpider is being able to backtest right on the screen. Yeah. And that goes back to what you're talking about there is finding like uh, a moving average or something that that historically right. has shown to to be the, the level of interest, right? And yeah. I love that because that, that's kind of my go-to. It's just selling put spreads on uh, back-tested moving averages, right? Like the SPY, maybe it's a 15-day or maybe it's a 20-day or something like that. Anytime it's above that, I'm like, I can I can sell put spreads and it's fine because right. you know, I can have it come down all the way to those uh, the moving average lines. And you know, it's so key there that, that just because you think something's going to happen until the market actually shows that it's happening, nothing's happened. And right. I remember in, uh, in Mark Minervini's, yeah, it's, it's all in your head, right? And I remember Mark Minervini's book, uh, or one of the books, he talks mm-hmm. about like, you um, you never know how low, low can go, right? right. Or something along yeah. those lines, right? It's true. You've got a chart and it's trending down and you decide, hey, trust me, one of the, I blew up, I blew up my account twice. One of the times I blew up my account was because I decided that I was going to pick the low in gold 
And as gold was like clearly turning down, like any fool can look on a chart and see that it's turning right. down. This guy was like, it's turning around here. I know it. Yeah, that was that was a huge mistake. Well, we but tell you know ourselves what? it's down too much or, you know, our stock is up too much. Yeah. Like, if there's still sellers in the market and understand what drives those sellers, maybe they're, you know, getting margin calls. Maybe they're just, you know, mass liquidating for a reason we don't know, but we'll find out down the road. That's why mm -hmm. they say the market's a discounting mechanism. It, it discounts the, the past and looks forward to the future. So it's not about today's headline. And and, and certainly we, we relearn that with the pandemic that, you know, as it started climbing out of those March lows, everyone was looking like, why is this thing going up? It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I'm going to short it. It's, it doesn't, you know, and, and just get over and run right. over um, until you start to listen to the message of the market and realize that it's price action that matters. Only price pays. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. I, and when, you know, when I first started, I couldn't tell you how many indicators I wanted to stack on top of each other. And then I would just throw it all out the window because I'm like, I know what I, I know better. <laughs> we we all then, you do. Know, I, yeah. Trust me, I did. That's how I stumbled into the volume weighted average price. I mean, we should always strive to be better. Now, as, as I'm you know later in my career, I'm skeptical of most of these new oscillators and indicators. But I'll give them a look, and, and I'll you know I'll still give them a look just because we're always trying to crack the code, right, and, yeah. and get that magic indicator which doesn't exist. To me, the anchored volume weighted average price is as close to it as you're going to get because it actually measures price, volume, and time combined uh, to to give us the true sentiment to you know the actually what people are doing with their money, not what the analysts are saying, not what the headlines are saying. Cut out all the bullshit. It's about price, volume, and time, mm -hmm. and where do I fit in with my time frame and my personality? And that's that's a big thing that, you know, people don't address enough, I think, as well, Chris, is that, you know, what is your time frame? I identify as a swing trader. You're more of a, a you know, a, a spread. Uh, is that right? You sell spreads? Is yes, but I, I still look at seven to 10 days out. Like, that's my go-to. And right. Uh, I mean, I, I've tried to day trade and it ain't for me. I can tell you that for sure. But I've it also tried like longer. I, I've also tried selling uh, spreads longer term. And that really went against me because like that's just too long to be in a, a trade because I mean, the market can do anything in that time. Right. So that's what I've kind of narrowed it down to is in the seven to 10 day time frame. Yeah, that's that's kind of the sweet spot. And, you know, for, for a swing trade, it's. I, I want to hold maybe up to three weeks. Generally, they won't, you know, they won't let me because it starts breaking that pattern of higher right. highs and higher lows. So I, you know, it's it's not up to me. It's it's up to the market. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's up to me if I'm being stubborn, if I think I'm extra smart, or you know, I still, you know, after doing this for so long, I still am, am amazed sometimes that I can find this or the, this other personality of mine still finds its way into my account once in a while. <sighs> <laughs> I've gotten so much better at, at, you know, at maintaining it and recognizing it and, you know, getting rid of it immediately. But it, it's it's crazy how human nature can still creep in once you know and you look at it and go, wait a minute, why am I doing this? This is completely stupid. Um, but I, I still will do that once in a while. You know, Brian, I, I call that monkey brain. Yeah, and exactly. I, I actually have a notepad on my computer that uh, I, it's called monkey brain and, and I'll just jot down my thoughts there because otherwise like I, I, I am like super ADD and I can have a million things going on all at the same time. And it's like, I got to get this off my off my mind and I'll come back to my monkey brain list later. Right. So, yeah, dude, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, this is this, this is a list I was working on right before we spoke. I've just got all these little <laughs> symbols and I wrote down your uh, recommendation for a book as well. The oh, rich yeah. Dad, poor dad. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, new trader, rich trader. That's it from Steve Burns. Oh, nutrient rich. New trader, rich trader. Oh, uh, by trader. Steve Burns. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, or, right. Okay, I'm sorry. It's written like rich dad, poor dad, and that's Got that's it. what I love about it. Is it's it's such um, it, it's such a good novel. I've actually scratched uh, out, rewrote. There you go. <laughs> um, I, I've had Steve on the podcast. Oh man, a dozen times, maybe more. Um, such a great guy. But that book is just so good. And and, and I, I have just reread it. What month is this? In the last six weeks. Just because it's back to. And as 
the the qualities of a rich trader it's like okay i've got this i've got this i've got this i've got this wait a minute i need to go and revisit that it's been a while since i thought about that let's go back yeah. and check it out real quick and honestly if if the audience doesn't already have it out there um i'll, I'll drop a link below and and a link to brian's book as well on amazon um but i mean just being able to to hear what and that's one of the reasons I love doing this podcast is because I can actually talk to people and it's not like me just like do this, do that, do this, do that. Right. It's, right. it's a, co a, a, a conversation. And I'll tell you, Brian, one of the things I found is nine and a half out of 10 people I talk to on the show, pretty much all say the exact same thing. And I think that that really means that success leaves clues Right. And it's these people who have picked up these clues, right? And they're all following the same path to get to the the success goal. And um, I, I think I think that's one of Tony Robbins's quotes: "Is success leaves clues, and you just got got to know where to find it." Right. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, the, and, and they, they always say, you know, the 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 market leaves footsteps. You know, the the institutions leave their footsteps. You can see the accumulation. And you can ride that wave and let them do the dirty work of buying the pullback and, and creating the support. Because we're not going to do it with our accounts. I mean, even if you have a, let's say you have a $20 million account, you're not going to impact the market at all. You need the billion dollar funds mm -hmm. to create support. And you know why put your money at risk and buying that pullback just because you think it's a good stock and it's cheap or whatever. All, you know, how many times have they said that, uh, Maybe not in the last year, but I think that I heard that Amazon has had a 60% plus drawdown in all but maybe the last two years. But every wow. single year is a publicly traded company drawn down 60%. Those are massive drawdowns. And if you're levered at all or if you become emotional, you're always going to sell at the bottom. If you're trying to pick the low where you think it's a great company, it's down 20%, it's got to be a buy. Now it's down 30%. What do I do? Do I buy more? 40%? You double up. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you just get into that cycle that, you know, you can't, now I can't admit I'm wrong. I, I'm, I'm married to this thing. And the best thing to do is just peel that Band-Aid and say, start over. Let me regroup, refocus here. You, you, you pull it off right at the worst time. But, you know, refocus and get your mind back too. You know, I... I have a course and in the course, one of the lessons um, talks about, you know, cutting your losses short and letting your winners run out of control. And uh, it was a quote that I saw somewhere and, and it was just such a brilliant quote, but it's, it's the concept of buying high and then selling higher. Right. And when I've tried to explain that to people who have never traded or they've just casually traded, or maybe they're just like investors and things like that, the concept of buying high and selling higher like blows their mind, Brian. They look at me like, no, you're supposed to buy low and sell high, you it, idiot. What do you know? Exactly. And it, it's counter to everything we've learned about consumerism in general. I mean, mm -hmm. we wait to buy things on the Thanksgiving sale or the New Year's sale or the you know May Labor Day sale, whatever, because we know those are going to be there. Why would we pay this higher price? But in, in the market, it's, it's about momentum is what I think people don't understand is that you want the the wind in your sails to your back, as they say. And if you can wait out that corrective mode, let it turn sideways and get involved at the first sign that there's a higher high and then protect yourself, well, it does a couple things. Now you can take a, a maximum share size because you know your risk. And you're with that momentum, the chances are you're going to have a better opportunity to be right from the start. Mm -hmm. It com you know, comes down to definition of trend. People are trying to buy stocks and pullbacks all the time, but if a stock in a downtrend, they're they're you know they're thinking, well, it's you know it's in a downtrend, but it'll bottom soon. There's just more opportunity on the short side because lower highs and lower lows. The math is simple: it drops three, it rallies two; it drops five, it rallies four dollars and eighty cents. The sum of the declines is greater than the sum of the rallies. Why try to buy it for those rallies? especially when you consider momentum and again, the math just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, I, one of my brother-in-laws, he, uh, he bought, uh, ACB. It's one of the marijuana stocks. Yeah. Yeah. When it was, uh, I think it was around like $10 or so. Okay. And when even. it was like, <laughs> what is that? He's break even today. 
Is it? Oh, okay. Right. It must have well, been on I a think run. It's about eight now. We're. Uh, Are you yeah. looking at it right now? It's ten bucks right now. Look, you just happen to have that up right now. You're a pro. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, it was like four dollars or something. And uh, three days ago. Oh, was it three days ago? Yeah. Well, this is a while. I mean, we're talking a couple years ago that he bought it, and uh, it dropped and it dropped. And he called me and he's like, "What do I do?" Well, were you planning to get out? And he's like, "Well, I kind of doubled up." after it dropped to like six and I'm like, okay. <laughs> and right. I was like, um, I know you don't want to hear this, but I would probably get out. And he's like, Oh, I'm married to it. Right. And like you were just talking about, yeah. and it went down lower and lower. And, uh, and then he called me the other day about another stock and he's like, it's down. What should I, should I buy it? And I'm like, no, don't it's down for a reason. I was like, right. if it gets back up, let's call it like 200. If it goes over 200, maybe not, then's a great time. But now when it's down at 180 and it was at 200 a couple of weeks ago, it now is not a great time. Like, obviously, people are selling it for a reason. Are you really wanting to buy the things that they're getting rid of right now? Or right. do you want to be do you want to be, uh, you know, scooping up all the all the things like do you want? This is 2020. Do you want to be scooping up all the toilet paper when everyone else is trying right. to buy it? Or do you want to be getting rid of all the toilet paper when everyone else is trying to buy it? You know what I mean? You, you got to yep. you got to work with the trends. Yeah. So sorry, that was a that was a crude example, but you know, no, it's a good example. Crazy. It's common sense. It's I mean, it seems common sense, right? In everyday activity, it's common sense. But then when we get into the market, we look at it and say, hey, but it's Apple, IBM, whatever you know, it's Tesla. But when it's going down, let it go down without you. Wait for wait, and if you miss it, you miss it. You know, people beat themselves up, as they oh, say. Though, yeah, it's. It's better to be on the sidelines in cash than it is to be in the market and wish that you were in cash. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that peace of mind from from being on the sidelines and, and the FOMO starts kicking in. I, I get that, too. But, you know, if you, if you have confidence in your system and your ability to look at the market objectively and find the right opportunities, you're going to miss trades. And if you're being disciplined, you're going to miss trades. If, if it gaps up and you say, my rule is I don't buy them if they gap up this amount, mm -hmm. and then it goes on another 10% the next day, it happens. Mm -hmm. it, it happens to every one of us. Trade and engage the market on your rules. If you have the knowledge that they are good rules, it, it's hard to get there, of course, to get that knowledge and ingrain it into a strategy, a system that works well for you. But once you're there, trust the process and you know let it let it work for you mm -hmm. yeah well said brian you know i gotta tell you this has been this has been a really good chat i i feel right. like we could go hours and hours on this so so let's let's shift over to you, your book real quick multiple okay. time uh technical analysis using multiple time frames when i discovered multiple time frames in trend spider i was like blah this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> i love being able to see the like the daily next to the hourly or the 15 minute next to the daily or something like that yeah. on the same chart, you know, having uh, one trend line and then the other trend line just right beside it. That is so cool. What compelled it's, you to write this book? You know, I didn't really see that there was an approach based on it. So the, the subtitle is how to profit from trend alignment. Um, you know, the people want to buy they, one of the most common things I see is, is people asking me, you know, what do you think about, let's say ACB. They might ask me that today. I'm like, are you out of your mind? It was just $4 three days ago and it's 10. You want to buy now? It's a great deal, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> where has it come from, right? Where it, has it expended a lot of energy getting to where it is? And right now it's right at a declining 200 day moving average. It's also right at the declining year to date volume weighted average price. So that's where it has the potential to go where it's likely to find supply. It's a level of interest on the upside. It doesn't mean I'm going to short it there, but I sure as hell don't want to buy it after it's gone 150% in three days. Where has it come from? Can I, you know, I can I identify a low risk entry point where I can put my stop pretty tight? Or do I put my stop now at five dollars a share and it's 10? That's that's just dumb. What's your upside? What can you reasonably expect when it's at this level of interest that might become resistance on the upside. So uh, trend alignment is simply trying to get involved. Let's say let's say it pulls back over the next week and a half and hits a low of six dollars and twenty cents. It turns sideways and then it's at about seven thirty 
and it breaks a higher high. I'll buy it at 730 and put my stop at maybe 670 if that was the most recent relevant higher low mm -hmm. for my time frame. So my, my stop is going to go underneath the most recent relevant higher low once it makes that higher high. So because what, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to participate in an unfolding trend, an emerging trend. What's the definition of trend? Higher highs and higher lows. So if I buy that first higher high and not above 10 and a half, but as it, you know, the pullback settles down and comes in that trend, the trend within the trend is what we need to focus on. I don't want to buy the breakout above ten ten dollars. That's you know, and where does your stuff go? So that's kind of what motivated me to write it. And and it it, it actually was um, you know, I have two sons who are uh my older son's twenty-five, and I kind of thought it would be a great way for him to learn it as well. So as you said, it's it's a textbook, but it's it's written in in plain English. It shouldn't put you to sleep if you have an interest in the market. Anybody else, like if you have insomnia and you're not interested <laughs> in the market, here you go. Yeah. <laughs> so how long did it take you to write this? It looks like a big book. It took. Uh, you know, so so the interesting thing about that one, Chris, is that it took me probably about six to nine months to write, which is pretty quick actually. Um, but for years prior to that, probably about six or seven years, I had been writing outlines for a book and I had about 20 of them. And I just kind of put all my outlines together and, and got it organized. And then after that, it just kind of, you know, I told my dad this, I, I said, it kind of wrote itself. It was really weird because it had been rattling around in my brain for close to a decade. And then when I finally, you know, got organized, it was quick. So um, I'm, I'm writing a new book about the anchored VWAP and I, oh, cool. I, I'm embarrassed to say I started it about two years ago and I'm just picking it up again after basically letting it sit since February of this year. So for 10 months, I've done nothing with it, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it this time. I, I, I've got about 40,000 words, which is a lot of words and I've got a ton of charts compiled. So hopefully I can get that out in the first half of next year. So, man, this is really cool. So, what? Uh, I, I'm going to ask a probing question here, Brian. You're yeah, ready? go ahead. Why'd you put it down? Why what? Why'd you put it down? Why didn't you keep working on it? I, you know, some people call it writer's block. I don't know. <laughs> I just I got tired of it. I wasn't I wasn't progressing with it, and then I put it down for a little while and. You know, I was telling my wife, it's kind of like doing your taxes. You get like 90% of the way there and then you set it down until April. And then, in, <laughs> you know, let's say in January, you're like, I'm going to get it done quick. You get 80% done. And then in April 12th, you go back and you're like, I forgot how I organized this whole thing. And you find you have to do the whole thing over again. It's kind of been like that. So coming back to it has been kind of intimidating that I have all this work there, but I kind of forgot where my whole, I'm not a good note taker. Uh, I, I keep it all, try to keep it all up in my head and that's not the best system. So I have to kind of start over, reread <laughs> it, reorganize it, rewrite sections, that sort of thing. So what is, um, what's bottom line what? mental defects? Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what caused you to come back to it? Because now, now you've had it for a while. You've got something else on your mind. So we stopped writing on it for 10 months. I'm betting something came across your, your day and you're like, I should get back on that book. What was it? It's just that it's there and I have so much of it done. I mean, I, I've, I've, and, I've, and I kind of, so I tweeted, uh, maybe put it on Twitter about a month ago, said, I'm writing this book, and this is the first time I've really made it public. So now I'm accountable to yeah, someone, someone else, right? So um, the reason, though, is just because – and what would actually annoy me is if somebody, meanwhile, comes out with an anchored volume-weighted average price book. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? So I – you know, there's, there's the get it to market as well, and it's just – the and people are ready for it. I mean, the the popularity of the oh, anchored yeah. VWAP over the last year year and a half has really exploded. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, and you know, thanks a lot to the people at, at uh, our friends at Trend Spider as well. They've really been big promoters of it. And now, as I said, uh, in the last year, 
you know, year and a half, they added it. Uh, stock charts added uh, the, the anchored volume weighted average price, wealth charts. And there's other ones that I'm, or, or, or trading view is a big one. They just added it this year as well. So now it's in the hands of a lot of people who can use it. But a lot of people are saying, like, they asked me the same question, which which I understand. Like, well, where do I anchor? Uh, well, go read this blog post. Go look at my website. I've got a VWAP tab. But I need to, you know, just get it concise altogether. That that makes total sense. And in fact, I wanted to pull up your your Twitter real quick. Um, it's Alpha Trends, right? I, yeah. Yep. Okay. Because, like, you do so much, and that's one of the things that I think is incredible: how much work you're doing on here, um, and how much you're showcasing the the anchor VWAP just like right. over and over and over. And I think that being able to, to showcase that is so important. That way it's not just like, Hey, it's really good. Trust me. Right. But you can right. actually show it on there over and over. I mean, you've got, uh, several things just today showing, you know, different arrows and different, uh, right. things that it's bouncing off of. So, I mean, you do incredible work and that, that shows cause you've got, uh, 132,000 people, that are looking at your your posts and that I mean you're making a difference in the world man I, I know that sounds crazy to, to, to think about but if what you and I can do is help other people find a financial edge and in some way that that impacts them and it impacts their family and it impacts those around them and, and their communities like I think that that's what people like you and I are, are sent to do and like when the coronavirus happened, right, I'm looking at all these restaurants and there's nobody in them. And right. I'm looking at the waiters and there are like, I don't know what to do. Like that was when my like giving light came on. I'm like, this is where I can make a difference. And I'm not at all trying to brag, but like yeah, my yeah. tips, my tips quadrupled in the time that the coronavirus has been on. And now that's like my new standard because it's like, I know that I have a, a, a a position in life where I can afford to give you more money. And I know that I'm doing my part to help further you in, in, in your journey. And I think that that's the case here with, um, Brian's, uh, Twitter is because you provide so much value up here and that's why people really flock to you. And I think that's incredible. So well, thank I, you for it's, that. It's work I'm doing for myself anyway. So, you know, might as well share it as well. And, it, yeah. and if, and, and I'm not here to plug a service, but I do have a service. If you want to take a further look, then, you know, I, I do videos every day that kind of drill down and explain what we are talking about live on a chart, pointing it out, clicking the VWAP and showing where, you know, it's kind of the master class uh, day to day. Uh, it's not it's not just a hindsight book where you can easily come up with pictures and say, here's how it works. Perfect. And that's that's the thing I'm going to do with this book as well is say here's how we would look at it here's why we take a stop you know it didn't work and guess what that's the way the market is it doesn't always just, it's not textbook perfect cookie cutter examples brian i'm sure you're familiar with the pervasive fake gurus all over social media now yeah dude i couldn't tell you how many times i've lost and talked about losses and explained my losses and just went in full detail Right. And I am so good with that. And then you see the opposite end, right? Because I'm pretty sure I'm not going to scroll through here and see your Lamborghini. I'm just guessing. Yeah. I, I mean, just, just, I mean, you, you could probably scroll through mine if I'm my, my Lamborghini. But you know, <laughs> there, there's this this whole fake guru thing going on right now, and it's going to come back and it's going to bite these people at some point. But you know, finding somebody like you that gives, that really cares, and knows your stuff. I think is incredible. And Brian, I've, I'm so excited to uh, have you on and, and to learn more about your story and to, to chat with you about all this. Man, you dropped so much knowledge here today. Cool, thanks. Hope I hope your audience you know, appreciate, appreciates how to understand it because it's, it's difficult to kind of see the chart that I'm trying to explain. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, going back to I like to look at pictures. I, I, I never, as a kid, read Playboy. I looked at it. And it, to describe <laughs> it, I mean, you can describe it, I guess, a little bit. I, I shouldn't go in this area, I guess. It's, but the no, point it's is, good. <laughs> where, you know, you could, to see it on the chart as you're describing it is, 
and, and every Friday I do a, a free video where I go over that and put it on YouTube and and talk about the market and some stocks. So that's another thing, you know, way that people can look at it and you know, for free. Cool, Brian. What's your YouTube channel? Uh, I think it's Thermal One. T H E R M A L A L Number One. So I used to be in the hang gliding, and that was we'd ride thermals. Oh wow, that's cool. Hang on, there you are, Brian Shannon. If you All look right. at non-market stuff, there, I, I will tell you, Chris, there is a Lamborghini video. Oh I, no! I, I, I it was ten years or so ago. I rented it for for a half a day in Las Vegas because I'm a car guy, not because yeah. I'm I never used it to promote anything, but because it was just awesome to drive. You know what? I've done the same thing. I rented. Well, it was a, it was a birthday present. It was um, it was uh, a day with a Ferrari at a, oh, nice. a racetrack here, dude. That that was a lot of fun. But I got to tell you, like, I on a normal basis, I, I was talking about this on the other podcast, so I don't mind sharing. On the normal day to day, I drive a Mini Cooper. Like, yeah. it's it's not ostentatious whatsoever. But I they must have had that Ferrari tuned down because my little Mini Cooper with the turbo on it, I think really? it could have kept up. Or maybe wow. my Mini Cooper's just that hot. I don't know. <laughs> the, the interesting thing is when I went to the rental place, it was I'm a Ferrari guy. Or, you know, mm -hmm. I envisioned myself one. Yeah, yeah. The Ferrari was broken down. So they said, we'll give you the upgrade to the Lamborghini. I'm like, that's not an upgrade, bro. And they gave me this flashy yellow Lamborghini. Oh, man. And it's just not my personality. I felt like, you know, some flashy NBA player who just signed a contract. <laughs> But the crazy thing is, when I got into that car and sat down and started gunning it, it it was weird. It became my personality. It was kind of scary. <laughs> Whoa, that's interesting. You know, the uh, the Ferrari that I drove, it was a red 360 um, Spider. So I'm sure you nice. know all about that. Yeah. Um, are you a Formula One guy? I'm not, no. No? I was um, going to say, uh, Ferraris are, I, I mean, Ferrari... Or Formula One was meant to be a, a a showcase for Ferrari, but there hasn't been the case for the last couple of years. So. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, no worries though. Well, Brian, um, you know, I, here's what I'm gonna do. I would like everybody who's watching and listening to go to alphatrends.net, not .com. Right. Then after that, uh, click the link below for Brian's book on Amazon called Technical Analysis Using Multiple Time Frames. And then I'm giving people homework here. Head over to Twitter to Alpha Trends. And then when you're done with that, head over to Thermal One on Brian's YouTube channel. I, I mean, you have videos. I mean, yeah, these are up to date. You've just got one um, from last week, and I bet oh, you're going to put one right. out later. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And it looks like the picture is a little bit older because you, you might have a couple of your hair. I might have some hair on that picture. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, man, I know I know about that. I take uh, I take hair pills. I want to keep what I got. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I, that ship sailed. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, this has been a lot of fun today, man. I really, really appreciate your time and being able to 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 hear um, the your backstory to hear all these incredible details about the, the anchor VWAP and man, you really dropped a lot of knowledge and, and I highly encourage the, the, the audience to go back and listen to this episode a couple of times, just on what Brian's saying. Don't worry about what I said, go back to what Brian said and listen to that. Cause he dropped crazy, crazy knowledge today. Brian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Chris. Been, been, been a pleasure. And thank you. Okay. So what'd you think? That was pretty incredible, right? Now, if you like that, that's only a taste, only a sample of what you're gonna find in the full AI stock trading system. And I really highly encourage you to go and check this out. Obviously, you are interested in learning and how to trade, and that's why you're listening to this podcast. Now, I'm going to take and download my entire trading system that I use day in and day out onto you. <laughs> and the only way I'm gonna be able to do that is over at the AIStockTradingSystem.com. You're gonna get phase one, two, and three, several bonuses. And on top of that, I'm going to walk you through over a dozen trades that I put on inside of my account, holding your hand and showing you exactly how I got in, how I got out, how I use the artificial intelligence data, and how this could work inside of your own trading portfolio on a daily basis. So make sure you head on over to AIStockTradingSystem.com. That's AIStockTradingSystem.com to learn more and to get started and to download my decade plus worth of trading experience into your hands so you can start using the AI Stock Trading System today. 
the five-step system to take the guesswork out of trading. Hey, if you like this video, let me know by leaving me a like below and then subscribe and share it with somebody you think could use it as well. Be sure to comment below with your biggest takeaway from this episode and any suggestions you have for future episodes. And finally, make sure you watch these other videos to help you trade faster and trade smarter, and I'll see you on the next episode.